This video is to help people following the PDF of the patterns for making a tie-on face mask and full-length open back medical gown. It's a PDF that I have released on my website and I've been sharing it with my sewing group. Um, I'm not going to edit this video very much so I apologize for any stuttering or mumbles that I might have. I'll tell you how this came about. I went to my local hospital. They mentioned that they were out of the full length, uh, well, getting to be out of their full length medical gowns. And so they were kind enough to call on housekeeping. After a few minutes, they were able to locate a spare uh, gown for me to take some measurements off of. And this is all the notes that I had to go off of. I took about three reference photos and then I went home and started making this pattern. Now I have to say the only tools that I had on me was a ballpoint pen, tape, scissors, and um, and some whiteout, the calculator on my cell phone, and my brainstorming wrong t-shirt. That's, uh, that's all I used for drafting this up. If you or someone you know knows how to take things like this and turn it into a digital document that can be put on one of those large format printers so that full pattern pieces could actually be printed out. That would be great. I know people at some maker spaces, people who are engineers, and maybe some of you could take my PDF, look through it, and turn my hand-drawn designs into something more nice looking but you know this is just what i did this is my second draft over here is my first draft there's a few steps that i actually didn't manage to make it into either of these drafts and i'm hoping to correct that right now if you go to your pdf of uh the tie on mask what happened was when i initially did this i was trying to figure out how to explain to someone the box pleat and so i ended up doing the uh, steps backwards in between step one and step two. It'll look like this on yours. Between step one and step two, uh, once you've turned it right side out, it's gonna be where you put the wire in for an insert. You can also uh, have an additional, so this is gonna be 2B, A. So 2B, Cut a ill ter fabric to slide inside the pocket. Now it's going to be slightly smaller because remember this was an eight by eight square. So you've lost about a quarter inch on either end. So this, once you've flipped it around is from top to bottom about seven and a half inches, but we've lost another quarter inch uh, with the channel for the wire. So that means that you're actually going to be cutting a seven and a quarter or seven inch by eight inch square of filter fabric to go in there. You could put the filter fabric in before you put the nose bridge stitch across and that's just fine. I've had people ask about iron on interfacing versus regular interfacing because iron on interfacing eventually will lose its iron stickiness because these things are going to get washed over and over again in very hot washes at the hospital. It doesn't really matter in the end product which one you use because eventually the interfacing is going to be regular interfacing. Well, what if I don't have interfacing? Filter fabric could be a variety of non-woven materials, dryer sheets uh, that have been used and washed enough times that there's no scent, no perfume or um, chemicals left in them. You can also use the um, color grab sheets that are non-woven as long as they've been used and don't have any chemicals in them. I've heard people use uh, garden row covers uh, if you cut them into the right sizes and you wash them to make sure that there's no garden chemicals on them. Those could be used. It just has to be a non-woven fabric uh, to do that. However, if you don't have anything like that, you could use another woven fabric that's maybe fluffier like um, a cotton fleece as the liner in there. 
what if you don't have anything at all to put in there just a couple extra folds of any sort of cotton would do and if you're really running short on materials at least having those two layers of tight woven uh, cotton on the outside is enough in just a second i'll show you what i mean by tight woven fabric i teach beginning sewing lessons and because i teach beginning sewing lessons some of this is going to be review for you experienced sewers but for those of you that this is going to be some of your first forays into doing sewing i'm going to explain weave i have a piece of burlap here and every woven fabric has a warp and a weft those are the fab uh, fibers that go across let's see warp is up and down and weft is across but honestly on a burlap or most cottons that's not easy to tell which is which because they'll be the exact same fiber now burlap is a very loose weave and you can see all the holes in this where in between each of the threads you can see straight through so burlap would be a terrible material to do masks out of don't even use that toss it away into the outbox so what could I use? Well, this is 100% cotton, but it is an eyelet lace, which means it has beautiful, cute, purposeful holes in it. That, uh-uh, 100% -uh, cotton goes in the out box. All right, so now I have a plain cotton. And okay, it's looking good. It doesn't have any holes in it, but ooh, look at how sheer that is. In fact, you can, you can make out my hand and my my engagement ring straight through this fabric. So this would not be good for a mask. Now, could I do multiple layers and just, you know, two or three layers to get the thickness? Maybe, but that's gonna be pretty bulky. So I don't wanna use this unless it's at a last resort. It could be the inside liner. If I've got a good fil filter fabric, <laughs> there was one of my stutters, please forgive me. So if you have a good filter fabric and a good exterior fabric you might skimp and use this as a liner but i would for now put it into my out box because it's not going to do very well but in comparison to that let's look at this one yes it's got a cute little hand done boutique design didn't i do a cute job on that but look at how sturdy this fabric is you can't see my hand through it you can't see the fiber of the table underneath this is a tight weave so this one i could definitely use definitely for the exterior of my mask it would make uh, a decent uh, interior as well and if i end up running out of interfacing or uh, dryer sheets or whatever non-woven this could also do decently for uh, an interior filter fabric if i have nothing else left but definitely this one is going to be the exterior of some beautiful hand painted dyed masks now i have a ton of fabrics so how do i go through and decide what goes into the bin well again if i can see through it that is a, a definite no-no on some fabrics that's a good one so i'm gonna keep that i go over here ugh, vintage fabrics i have a ton of vintage fabrics but these are old in fact this one i think is from 1930s this one's from the six fifties sixties uh i can't use these because as fabric ages it stops having integrity and starts falling apart and i don't want these masks falling apart in the heavy use they're going to get in the hospital so those go into the no box all right i've got this cool 70s uh style but i don't think it's actually 70s um upholstery fabric it's a little bit too loose a weave it's getting closer to that burlap where it's got large fibers that have bigger holes i know that some denims and some canvases are very tight weaves you can use those in fact i would definitely say use those for the robes uh, for the long gowns if you've got the two and a half to three yards that you need of that so these canvases good but use them for robes so right now for masks i'm putting in the out but that's a good robe fabric i don't have enough of that to make a robe but 
that's a thing. Okay, linen, nice natural fiber, but again, just like the burlap, it's too loose of a weave, so it's going in the outbox. More lace go in the outbox. Ah, strawberries. It's looking pretty good. I can't see through it easily. So this one, strawberries, they are a go. Ha. Huh. These sugar skulls are incredibly cute, but in the dire situation that we are in right now, I don't think I'm going to do skulls. That might creep people out. Even glow in the dark skeletons. I probably have three yards of this, but I'm not gonna make a robe out of this because that is kind of creepy. It's great for Halloween, but no, not for the current situation. Pom-poms, why do I even have those on the table? All right, denim maybe for the robes, but definitely not this project. Okay, this cute printed cotton fabric. I'm saying definite maybe on that one. This gingham, oh, it's too sheer. The gingham is out, but you might have a gingham that, that could work. Don't just discard a plaid because it looked like my plaid. All right, there's more of the strawberry. Um, This is a cute strawberry, but I don't think I have enough of this to make a mask out of unless it was gonna be a little tiny itty bitty doll size mask so you're out all right so now i'm getting to other things what if i don't have normal yardage what if the fabric stores don't have anything well there's remnants they sometimes look like this this is a house of fabric remnants so if you're a sewer you kind of know how old this must be uh, but a remnant is a partial yard you can sometimes find them in discount bins you'll see these show up at thrift stores and things like that but if those are all closed in your areas because you're stuck inside you know you might have to cannibalize what can you cannibalize well this is a lovely tablecloth and four napkin set that I was going to, with the last remnants of the polka dot fabric that I have, I was going to make a coordinating apron. I'm not gonna be making a coordinating apron. I might have enough of this fabric to piece it together and make a mask out of polka dots, so that's a definite maybe. After that, I will probably use up the napkin fabric because i mean i don't always use fabric napkins and then after that i will use up this tablecloth because this is a good nice tightly woven fabric so those are some things that i can cannibalize if you have really uh nice bed sheets this is an egyptian cotton it's a high thread count. I can't remember off the top of my head, but though I love this set of sheets so much, this pillowcase has gotten a hole in it. Guess what? Your masks now. You might have a bin of fabric, and if you are a quilter, you're in such a great situation at this point in time. I do generally costumes, lots of different costumes, lots of weird costumes. So I've got a ton of decorative fabrics, but I don't have a ton of cottons. Some doctor is going to be so stoked to have the avengers i might have enough here to make the body or maybe the sleeves on a robe uh one of the gowns so i'm going to put that in my gown pile as i go through some of these are going to be good 100 percent cotton uh looks like this one is possibly also hundred percent cotton if you've got polyester cottons it's okay if it's what you've got use them but try very hard not to use polyester not to use uh, rayons or or other synthetics because these are gonna have to go through hot washes okay from the costume stash this is a set of black bed sheets and though you can't see through it because it's black i think it might be a bit thin this is a low quality set of sheets so i'm gonna reserve this for you know later oh, yeah it's got duct tape in it i think i got this from a college student so yeah if this one is not gonna work the high quality bed sheets yes low quality bed sheets those go in the no box all right we've got these guys we've got a ton of stuff I've got some beautiful panels for making circle skirts. I'm not gonna be making circle skirts. 
but I also, it hurts me to turn a skirt into a mask. I'm going to reserve this for later. It's not my highest quality. It is a polyester cotton. Uh, I will see about using this later on if I run out of regular cotton fabrics. That's a good one. This one's a good one. Oh, wow, hot pink. I am rocking my 80s childhood again. So just go through your bins, find the 100% cotton, find the ones that are tire weaves. Uh, you can sometimes tell if it's a print, if the print is shadowing through from the other side, this is probably a loose weave and not as good of a product. So just go through and choose your fabrics and get a nice big pile. Then, sorry about that. If you find that you have some that are around two and a half to three yards, you're gonna wanna set those aside so that you can start making the hospital gowns out of them. All of these here are not enough for a full gown each. I rarely have three yards of fabric when it comes to cottons. Usually if I'm doing three yards of fabric, it's gonna be in a huge dress or something like that and I know what I'm doing. I have three yards of silks and laces and things like that. We can't make silk hospital gowns. So what's probably gonna happen is I will make the bodies out of some of these and then I will go back to my smaller pieces to make sleeves to go to the bodies. So that's how you can order stuff. If you've got small bits of fabrics, those become masks. Medium bits of fabrics can become sleeves and large pieces of fabrics get to be the fronts and backs of the medical gowns. What a cute project. Cute and a lot of yardage, but also covered in skulls. It's the circle, the circle of life. Okay, I've gone through my fabrics and I've selected a pile of them that I believe are best for making masks because it's all under uh, two yards. And then I've made a pile over here of anything that I had two or more yards of. And for my example, I think I'm gonna go with this fabulous early 90s. 1980s. It looks like the background of the show in living color, if anyone remembers that. So I'm going to be making the uh, full length gown out of that one. But these guys are the ones that I'm going to be making masks out of. All right, I'm back upstairs and let's talk about the first thing, which is the mask. When I drafted this, I wanted the mask to fit all on one page. On my first draft, I did really detailed pictures, some of them uh, a bit larger, and I feel bad that I wasn't able to duplicate that in the one page version. So I'm just gonna get this on the screen really quickly so that you can pause this if you need to, because I really do like the illustrations on my first draft a little bit better. Right. So, you're going to need some materials. Different mask patterns will have different sizes, but I chose this uh, set of dimensions because it's multi-size and it's a little bit easy. You're going to need two 8 inch by 8 inch squares and uh, a third. Um, you could go 8 inch by 8 inch or 7 inch by 8 inch for that filter fabric. So that's something that needs to be added onto the materials list. Um, you're also going to need 8 by 12 inch fabric to make the double folded tape for the ties. That is all done in step 5 right here. I've got some nice illustrations on how to press, doing the close ups, fold in half. So you're going to be making ties with this. This is because elastic is in short supply. If you are a sewer who's for the first time pulling grandma's sewing machine out of the closet and you're trying to make this work, you know what? You might not have elastic on hand. So we're going to be making ties to tie this mask on. So by having eight by eight and eight by 12, that's eight inches by 20 inches total 
of a fabric. And most people can figure out how to just do that with a ruler. You don't have to get into intricate layouts of uh, the fabric on uh, yardage to try and get it to be the most efficient. Other tools you're gonna need is measuring tape for getting the eight by eight and eight by 12. Scissors for cutting the fabric, thread, an iron sewing machine, and that should be it. This is as minimal as a list as I could possibly come up with. You can have wire or metal for the nose bridge. I've already sent out an email. That is semi-optional. If you have glasses like me, if a mask doesn't pinch around the nose bridge, uh, what happens is our breath goes up through the top of the mask and fogs up our glasses, which can also happen with lab goggles. So that's why we have the metal in the nose bridge is to just give that a little bit more tightness so that the glasses and goggles don't fog up. If you don't have uh, chenille stems, wire, twist ties, the you know metal uh, wire from the top of a coffee bag, if you don't have those file folder bendable metal things, if you've got no piece of metal that you can use for that nose crimp part, it's okay. It's better to have some form of protection over the face rather than nothing at all. So just putting this fabric and uh, interfacing uh, barrier between their face and their patients is going to help the doctors. So adding on to this and one eight by eight line. Does liner have an E in it? L-I-N-E-R. Yeah. yeah. Lining, L-I-N-I-N-G. Filter. There we go. My dyslexia is coming out. All right, here we are back downstairs. You can print off, this is page two of that PDF document, that's the second page. It has all of the instructions you're gonna to wanna to add in those notes of 2B, cut a filter fabric, slide inside that pocket, and add it to your materials that you need two eight by eight squares of tight weave cotton and one eight by eight liner fabric. So add that to your materials and to your instruction sheet. For all of you beginners out there, we need to talk about tools because scissors are important. Now, uh, one of these things is not like the others. One of these things is not the same. And it is this guy. This is a stationary set of scissors. It's for cutting paper. Now, I like to keep my scissors generally sharp, even the paper ones, but this one will not be as good at cutting the fabric. But notice how the handles look so much the same between these inexpensive sewing scissors and these uh, paper scissors. You know what, if you only have paper scissors, as long as they're sharp enough that you can get through the fabric, you should be just fine. But whatever you do, do not use your good sewing scissors for paper because paper is wood and you will just dull your scissors so they stop doing the job. This, I, I like to call my Excalibur. It's got a golden handle. It's nice and sharp. And it even has a little plastic sheath for me to, um, to slide it into. But I'm not actually gonna use these because I want it to be as close to actual real life experience as uh, my viewers might be experiencing. So I'm gonna be using these less expensive sewing scissors. I'm going to not use the paper scissors, but if that's all you got, that's what you've got. So we're going to be cutting out two eight by eight squares. This is gonna be my lining fabric. This is gonna be my exterior fabric. And then when it comes to the eight by 12 fabric to make double fold tape for the ties, I've actually got uh, not only long lengths of the liner fabric, but I've got some plain muslin fabric as well. And I will show you how to uh, make those strips and put them together in just a little bit. It's tripod time. We are going to cut out eight by eight squares of our lining fabric and our exterior fabric. Could I use the exact same fabric for both? 
yes, but I'm going to do it in different fabrics so that you can see the front side versus the back side a little bit more easily. And I actually haven't found a dryer sheet or anything for the insert to have the filter, so I might just cut a different piece of fabric and put it inside. Just remember that's supposed to be a filter fabric, though I might not show that in this particular example. All right, so I need eight by eight. Take a ruler, measure the eight inches needed, and not the paper scissors, but the sewing scissors, I'm going to do a little snip at eight inches, and on the other side, I'm gonna do a snip at eight inches. Now, if your fabric is on grain, you can gently tear it you will end up with an eight by eight square. Now I already did that to the other edges. If you've got it like wonkily cut or something like that, this trick will not work. So in your cases, you're gonna measure your eight inches, do a little snip and eight inches and do a little snip. And then eight inches, take a regular pencil. You don't need Taylor's chalk. If you want to use Taylor's chalk, you can, but most people don't just have that on hand. So at eight inches, I'm going to make a pencil mark and I'm going to do one more in the middle and then it's connect the dots. I've got my slit there on the side. I've got the other two dots. That's three. That makes a nice straight line. Boom. Then I've got my eight inches snip eight inches and a dot and then I've got it over here but I just want to make sure that I have it at the right spot so eight inches there all right I take my straight edge I love a metal ruler but all you've got is your kids little plastic or wooden one raid their school supplies I mean they're not in the classroom right now so you might as well there we go straight line across now we snip and notice my my big fingers can go here and my thumb goes in there and these are multi-sided so if i were if i were left-handed i could do that i am not left-handed some scissors definitely have a right side to a left side so if you are a lefty you probably already own left-handed scissors likely in the paper scissors style use the scissors that work for your hands and then i'm going to just trim off this extra so this square is eight by eight so i have two squares now but for visual purposes i'm going to actually stop and cut the lining fabric uh, so that you can see the difference between the front and the back. Now it's hard to see if there's a right side or a wrong side to this. So in my next example, which is not going to be this one, I think I'm going to use the strawberry fabric. <laughs> so the next example you're going to see is going to be made with the strawberry fabric, not the flowers fabric. Okay. I cut the front of my mask. I cut the back of my mask. Both of these are eight inch by eight inch squares. I still couldn't find any spare dryer sheets that didn't end up being all stinky with all the perfume and stuff because I hadn't washed them yet. But then I realized all those reusable bags that you get at conventions, sometimes at grocery stores and such, this is a non-woven, plasticized fabric. So thank you, G Girl Genius. I think I got this at a Comic-Con or maybe Norwest Con years ago. <laughs> you are going to turn into the filter for my mask. I'm not going to use the part that's printed though, because that's got plastic on it. I'm just going to use the other uh, backside of it probably first uh, to make the 
interior filter for this. So that's another option for you if you don't have garden row covers or um, any other sort of you know, dryer cloths or the color catch cloths or anything like that. You can use your reusable uh, shopping bags because I mean, who's going out shopping now, right? Three layers, I've got my outside inside and the filter layer if you are doing an iron-on interfacing i suggest that you iron it onto not the part that's towards the face but instead on the back side of the beautiful exterior fabric because that way any glue from that iron-on interfacing isn't going to be immediately next to uh, where the person's mouth is it's going to be facing outwards uh, instead of being facing inward. So that's why I would suggest that. You'll notice that I've trimmed my filter fabric just slightly smaller than the interior. It's about a quarter inch in on each side. That way uh, it will actually fit. In fact, I probably need to trim off an extra quarter inch because there's gonna be that channel for where the metal stay for the nose bridge is going to be. So still a little bit of trimming needing to be done, but this will eventually be a sandwich. You don't want to stitch it like this though, because then you'll have all of these raw edges visible. What we have to do is we have to put right sides together or pretty sides together. So if you're an experienced sewer, you already know this. If you're not, what you do is you flip your pretty fabric so that it is belly to belly with the pretty fabric on the other side. Now this one's interior is just plain white cotton, so it doesn't really have a pretty side. But if you do have a pretty side, you wanna do this. <clears throat> Our next step is to one quarter inch in on both the top and the bottom, stitch those down. Now, if you want to, you can pin this down on something this small though. If you don't have pins or the pins are just really getting in your way, you don't have to pin on a small things like this. Once we get to the full uh, gown, you will want to have some pins though. So for a small, quick project, you can just let friction do the business. Now I don't use pink very often, so I'm kind of excited to be able to use up some of my pink thread. I'm gonna show you at least on a Singer Heavy duty, this is uh, a machine you can find in most uh, basic stores for purchasing. I'm gonna just show you how to thread the bobbin. If you look, there's a little diagram of the direction the thread's supposed to go. So I make sure that my thread is going the same direction, drop it in, and then I make sure that it catches in this little part here. Now this isn't the same for all machines. In fact, a lot of the newer machines that I have uh, seen, at least the mid and low level ones, they have the drop-in style bobbins. That's not true for older machines. I've got a ton of older machines. So I'll make another video to show you how to thread those machines. I'm gonna leave this lid off for now. I'm gonna do my upper thread here. If you're an experienced sewer, you already know how to do this, but if not, usually there's diagrams and you just follow the arrows. And right up here, there's this metal bar here. I'll turn on the side. There's a, a wheel here that you can turn for moving the needle up and down. Now I'm gonna just get that to that highest spot so you can see. Just hooks onto that, then goes down. And now we thread our sewing needle. I'll put down the presser foot. There's a little thing back there for putting down the presser foot. I'll put that down for now. And now, we thread our needle and oh my goodness, I did it on the first try. That never happens. There we go. Now I lift up my foot and I'm gonna go back to that hand turning wheel over there. And I'm just going to have it do one stitch where I hold on to the tail. It's hard to do this while holding the camera. And that thread goes around the bobbin and pulls up the bottom, bobbin, bottom, bobbin thread. Uh, my stutter came back. Okay, there we go. There's that. There's the threads. I'm going to put it there beneath the feet. Okay, and we are ready to stitch. Now, I had a really hard time trying to balance my tripod here. So, 
moving my camera back and forth between my two hands is a an interesting feat of dexterity that I'm not actually good at. So I will do my best to sort of one-handed do this seam. I would normally have both hands on the fabric holding it together, but I've got to have one hand on the camera. All right, what I'm gonna do is I've got my straight stitch set. I don't want the loosest stitch. That's the longest stitch. If I was doing something really fast, I might use that, but because we want this to not be very permeable, I'm gonna move it to two and a half, between the two and three. It's not a zigzag, so we've got my width at zero. I've got my needle centered between my presser feet. If I were to move it one direction, the needle would be off to that side. If I move it to the other direction, my needle goes to that side, but I want it straight in the middle. And then for tension, I think I'll have it at a three. And that's not a big deal most of the time, but uh, in another video when I talk about threading your machine. I'll talk about how you can tell whether you need to up your tension or down your tension. And that'll just be a completely different video. Let's get this mask started. So I know if I've got my sewing needle right there in the center, and if I match this up to the foot right there, that's about a quarter of an inch. So I'm going to just stitch this straight. If I want to have it a little bit more stable, I hit the reverse and I hold this down and let it take a few steps backwards. There we go. First seam down. Reverse it a little bit, and ta-da. Okay, up the presser foot, pull it out, and most machines have a little blade right there, and you can cut it and turn it. Now, if your machine doesn't have a little blade or you can't find it, it's okay. You can just reach in with your scissors. I cannot at the moment because I am busy holding onto a camera, but most of the time you could. All right. Now I get my corners even on the other side. All right. I really did have to use two hands to hold this tail while that first stitch went in, but now I'm ready to go. Oh, this one handed thing is harder than I thought. There we are. Okay, another tripod time. There, I'm actually on camera. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're going to turn it right sides out. So we've got this neat little tube going on here in this lovely strawberry shortcake-like fabric. All right, so now that I've got that, I can press it with a hot iron because this is all cotton. You can go with a really hot setting on your iron and make it nice and crisp. But I think I will just slide in the filter fabric at this point. And I'm gonna get that the edges of the strawberry fabric there and over here all right and now I'm going to take this back to my sewing machine and I'm going to stitch actually for you guys I'm gonna stitch right here at the top just in a quarter inch and that's where I'm gonna feed in my wire chenille stem um, bread twisty tie you know something to help that crimp over the nose. So that's next step. 
Hey, I figured out how to do a tripod view at the side. Normally I wouldn't be able to do this if I had a big piece of fabric because it would end up smacking the camera, but I think I can do it here because I can have the bulk of the fabric off to that side. So, put down my presser foot, grab my tails, make sure that they're behind the machine. I'm just wanting a quarter inch hold on to my tails, back stitch, and straight. Back stitch, and cut the thread. There we go. Now I've got that little channel to put the wire into. It's time for some pressing and some pleating. Now I understand not everyone lives in a 1950s house that has an in the wall uh, ironing board. If that's the case, these cute little numbers are available places and you can always just iron on um, a table or something like that as long as you have an appropriate cloth for that. Now, if you look here, that is a wool blanket that I cut into pieces multiple times and then staple gunned around this plywood board. And then over the top of that, I put this nifty uh, ironing cover. You don't need a nifty ironing cover. You really don't. If you just want to put down um, some heavy duty wool blankets, uh, wool generally is hard to burn you just need a little bit of cushion and then 100% uh, cotton over the top of that. You can use blankets or bed sheets, just tiny little bit of give, and then over the top of that, your cotton. When it comes to setting my iron after plugging it in, I turn it to the hottest mode. So whether you have a dial or something like that, because we're working with cotton, we can use the hottest mode. Um, I don't have any, oh, I do have a little bit of water in there. So I've got a little bit of water in there for steam. Most irons are gonna have a little spot for you to put in water. Never fill it past the maximum because you'll be sloshing water all over the place. You've gotta let it get up to heat, but some irons, and I don't know if this one is it, you have to turn it horizontal for a second and then turn it vertical and then it will start heating up. If you only have it vertical, some irons have a turn off timer. So if you leave it alone for a certain amount of time, for safety reasons, it'll auto turn off. Most don't as far as I know. So never trust your home's flammability to an iron that you just left on high. Okay, so I'm gonna iron this a little bit flat. Oh, look, it takes that so nicely. All right, so these edges are now crisp. And now we're going to do a box pleat. Now I just kind of eyeball these, but if you are a measurement person, uh, you can do that. Now this is a box pleat with the box on the back side. So we've got to actually reverse the way our brain thinks. Pretty side of the fabric down. Bring in one pleat. Bring in the next pleat and look at that okay now i want this pleat a little bit bigger so i might finagle it a little bit now my ironing board has this lovely ruler which is not 100 percent accurate but one two three four five inches i want it to be four inches on the side so i bring it together. Now this is not, do not try to like draft anything that needs to be engineering quality off of ruler marks drawn on a fabric ironing board cover. But for this project, it will do the deed. Just hold it down and press the iron. Now, you could do it in more steps than I just did. You could 
fold once iron fold once iron fold again iron fold again and iron but what I'm feeling is this interfacing that I put in there is starting to heat up and melt because it's a type of plastic. Remember, this is a non-woven fabric, so it is heat sensitive. So enough to get those creases there, but not so much that you end up melting your, uh, your filter fabric on the inside. Okay, now we're going to slide in our metal bar and stitch on the two sides of our mask. What do you use for that wire? You might say, well, I'm going to use electric fence utility wire. This is aluminum. So I'm going to measure off a few inches, but because I just snipped that with a wire cutter, I'm going to actually curve it back on itself so that hopefully it won't stab through the mask and get loose in the laundry or something like that. So I'm just going to crimp it back using the same pliers that I used to cut it. And this has enough bend to it that it can do a little nose bridge, but not so much that it'll flatten out all on its own accord. So it's flexible enough that it can bend straight or, you know, in the nose bridge shape and also can bend back to a sort of flat shape. Round end of the wire slips into the top and I'm just gonna shove it over until it's in the middle. Now, because I've got those little kind of loops to it, something that I could do is do a little hand stitch through one loop on one side and one loop on the other so it doesn't move around. Or if I've got something like one of those wide band uh, bread ties, I can do little end cap stitches to kind of hold it where it is so that it doesn't move around. In fact, I'm gonna do that right now. That's an added bonus feature, but you don't have to do that, particularly if you've got something that runs along the entire bridge. But if you're just using bread ties or something, keeping them in place with a little bit of stitching, either making them in a pocket or if you've bent it back like I did, just with you know a hand sewing needle kind of like a button just stitch it down so it doesn't slide back and forth side machine view again now this is where being able to move my sewing needle from one side to the other is really nice because i can't really go over the top of the bump of that wire very easily but i can move my sewing needle so it's closer to that and i'm just gonna stitch forward and then back just to hold that wire in place. Cut the thread. And then over to the other side. People can see how to do this one forward and there we go. That's it. Give it a snip. Now we've got all these fringy threads hanging out. We want to trim as many of those as we can before we are finished up. Otherwise, they're going to have little ticklies all over. Now, we still have those pleats all nice and stiff. So I'm going to press them down. So pinning it down is a good option for this point in things. But... Uh, I don't know. Hashtag yellow lifestyle, right? Keep your hands away from the sewing needle. But still guide it through. Back stitch at 
the front and the back. Press your foot up. Trim the thread. Nice. Okay. Now I go over to the other side. Line it up. Pleats in place. Back stitch. Fingers out of the way. Back stitch. And cut the thread. Cool. All right. Let's take this back to the table. Here's where we're at in instructions. We did that. We did that. We remembered to put filter fabric in. Then we jumped over and did these pleats and stuff, and we are here, but we need to go back for step number five. Step number five is probably going to be the most challenging for the beginner sewer, because the beginner sewer probably doesn't have a giant stash of elastic just hanging out in their house. So if you're not regularly a sewer, you might not just have elastic to do the air ties. So you're going to need to make this. This is double fold edge tape. And what this is going to do is it's going to, we're going to trim this and this is going to cover up the edge, but we're also going to have enough of it that it can be ties. But you're going to need to learn how to make your own. This is way bigger than what we would be using on our masks. This is about three inches wide instead of one inch wide and then folding in. But this gets you the idea. Now this is the right side. This is the wrong side. And you'll see that I have the grain going up and down. Now in this pink one, this pink one is a uh, store-bought bias tape, which means the grain on the light pink one is going across ways to the length. So it's going to be in little X's. We don't really have time for worrying about that because that means a lot of diagonal seaming and things like that. So instead, just worry about making straight, long, long strips cut evenly. There's cool rotary cutters that you can do for that. But if you don't have a rotary cutter, you can just measure things out, line it up with a, a pencil and a, and a ruler and just cut strips. You're going to stitch them. You put pretty sides together, do a stitch, flatten it out, take it to your iron and press that flat. You're going to go along and do that for a really, really long time until you've got a long, super long thang that has all these seams. Now you don't have to press after everyone. In fact, I would suggest stitching all of your pieces together and then at the end going and pressing over to the iron. And this is where me not having a taller uh, tripod really bites me because it's going to be hard for me to show this because the iron's going to be coming straight at you. So we've got our long strip where there's a seam, we take our iron and we press it open. So the two sides go back to where they came from instead of it all being on one side. So we press that open on all the seams. Now, all the way along our strip, we're going to fold it in half and iron it, move it along fold it in half and iron it, move it along and iron it. And we do that all the way down our strip. Next, we open it up and we take our edges. See that nice crease there in the middle? We take our edges and we bring them in towards the crease. Give it a bit of an iron and in towards the crease. Give it a bit of an iron and then move along. Moving right along. Do, 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 do. Cause you're his my way. 
Doot, 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 doot. I wish I had the Muppets right here to be serenading me because that would make this so much more fun. Oh wait, there's this thing called the internet. And if I weren't worried that I would mess up my audio, I would totally put on the Muppets right now. It's one of the nice things about sewing is you can have music or an audiobook or, or something that you enjoy that doesn't require your eyeballs in the background. I'm a big fan of audiobooks. I have crushed a number of audiobooks. My mom, she's a fan of cozy mysteries. So whether you like you know, political biographies of ancient uh, uh, individuals like you know, Justinian, Emperor Justinian, or if you're into uh, Agatha Christie, you can totally just jam out to an audiobook while you're saying, oh, I forgot to say. Now that we have the end sword in just the middle, we're going to just give it one last ironing, smooshing it in half, and this is our trim. Now this trim is like about three quarters of an inch wide. We need to have something that's a little bit skinnier. Half inch would do. Uh, so for a half inch, you would need something that would be about, um, let's see, one half, one half, one half. So if you had a two inch wide strip to the begin with, you would end up with a, a half inch wide uh, trim tape. If you're like this one, which start off as, as three inches, you quarter that, you end up with three quarters. So whatever happens, you're you're you know doing this to four one fourth of however wide you start with. So if you start with uh, one inch, you'll go down to a quarter inch. If you start with two inches, you'll go down to a half inch. Um, if you start with three inches, you'll end up with three quarters. I recommend starting with the two inches, going down to what will end up being a half inch trim. And uh, if you eventually get up to the skill where you can do the fine fiddly ironing to get that quarter inch trim, great quarter inch is easier when it gets to tying, but you know, we all do what we can. And it's better that the hospitals get some sort of mask that they can put around their faces than no masks at all. This is where perfect is the enemy of the good. It's good to have masks. It's bad to have no masks. So it's good to have even ugly looking masks, uh, not pretty looking masks, mismatched masks. It's better to have a mask that has chunky ties rather than no mask at all. So this is going to be slightly less than eight feet of uh, ties, but I found that uh, around eight feet, chop that in half, four foot each side, that's enough to make nice, fairly long ties. You can test it on your own head uh, before you donate it, but if you do that, throw it in the laundry. In fact, I'm going to be putting all of my stuff through on a hot wash uh, so that I can donate stuff that I know is safe because none of us can assume that we don't have coronavirus. There's people out there who are not showing symptoms who have it. We had a congressman, not from my state, but there was a congressman who didn't have any symptoms, but because of uh, lung issues that he had, he got tested. And what do you know? He actually had it, but he's had zero symptoms. So all of us have to assume that we have it and act accordingly in protecting others. Sometimes my GoPro changes modes without me noticing and it switched over from video mode to taking photographs mode for the entire uh, completion of this mask. But hey, don't worry, I caught it as I was uploading it all to my computer and so I jumped over to making a second one. Oh look, it's the doppelganger. So I'm gonna do it all a second time. Take two, electric boogaloo. All right, so I'm going to trim these edges very close to my stitches. Not 
cutting my stitches, but fairly close. So there's just a little bit remaining. It's also a good time to get any of those little whiskers taken care of. All right, this stuff goes into the trash. And now I take my double fold tape and I'm gonna find the center of this. This is actually about six and a half feet. I'm gonna find the middle, that's called the bite. I'm gonna cut it. So I'm gonna have three and some and three and some. More is good, but you don't wanna get it too terribly much because if it's way too much, then that's just gonna be more in the nurse's way when they're wearing this or in the doctor's way when they're wearing this. So now we take our halves, we find the middle again. What we're gonna do is we're gonna open it up at the middle, find the middle of our mask, and we're gonna sandwich the mask inside of our trim. And we're going to stitch the trim down so it's around the mask, and then we're going to stitch all the way along these tails so that those can be used as ties. Now I'm gonna use a zigzag stitch here on the mask part, and then a straight stitch all the way down, but you know, if you want to zigzag the whole way, I just find that a zigzag stitch makes sure that I'm getting this fully wrapped around. And so if things get a little bit wobbly and off, I've still got the edges encased and firmly attached to the ties, to the sewing machine. Wow, I just hit the go button and my Zen meditation music just got really intense. Okay. So I am going to get this underneath my sewing machine just so it's kind of held in place. But you'll notice that I am using a couple pins. That's just to make sure that the center part of my ties stays put. Okay, now that that's hanging out there, I'll show you how to adjust on this style of machine. We are going to keep our length at about the same between three and two, but we're gonna change our width to as wide as it goes and switch from single uh, straight stitch to boom, zigzag. All the rest of this I'm keeping the same. All right, what the zigzag is going to let me do is uh, as I go across this tape, if I get a little bit off, from one side to the other, it will still catch it because the needle is going back and forth into the little zigzag. So here we go. Forward stitch, back stitch, towards the middle, hit the camera with the fabric, back up the camera, readjust. Okay, stop before you get to the sewing needle. Pull out the sewing needle. You don't wanna hit a sewing, sorry, the pin. You don't wanna hit the sewing pin with the needle on your sewing machine, because if that happens, best case scenario is you bend a pin. Worst case scenario is you break your sewing needle. So you don't want that to happen. There we go. Zigzag on the back, zigzag on the front. Looks like my tension is a little bit loose actually on the top. So I'm gonna just tighten that up on this next one. We will see if that improves it. Forward stitch, back stitch, forward stitch. Pull out that sewing needle. Do a little adjustment. And back stitch and forward. Now, 
put my needle up. I'm going to not even bother cutting it off now. I'm going to switch back to single stitch and I'm going to single stitch down each one of these four ties. Now, because this one isn't construction, this one is gonna be going pretty fast. I'm gonna change the length to a four length. Gonna turn this back to zero. Gonna turn this back to straight stitch. Everything else, I'm keeping the same. Putting my camera down. And now I keep my fingers, because this is so small, I'm gonna be kind of steering from the end. And then when the last part of the tail goes in, I'm just gonna kind of let it go. Straight down the middle or as close to straight down the middle as you can. You don't have to go this fast if you're not comfortable. Okay, and now I let it go. And it went off the edge, but it's all right. It's just the end of the tail. No big deal. Move over to the next tie. It's going to be four stitch back stitch on this one and straight down the middle. Straight down, middle stretch. And it's coming to the end and she's letting it go. All right, cool. I'm just going to bring around my next tail here. Set it down. Forward stitch, back stitch, and a little bit of a wobble, but now it's straight down the middle. Alright. And the last one. Forward stitch, back stitch, and straight down the middle. should be done but we've got to do some cleanup so that it doesn't have any weird little whiskies okay here's the mask the tails are kind of attached at weird spots because I just went from one to another but now I have a chance to cut them all find any of those random strings that are just sticking out and snip them Snip, snip, there we go, get these extra strings all off, as many as I can find. There we go. Now, it's time to try this bad boy out. Glasses are coming off. Mask, nose bridge, wire fits right there. Tie around the back of my head up high. Nice little bow. Pop that open. Tie in the back. over the ears okay all right now I'm gonna put my glasses on check myself out in the mirror oh yeah that's good okay so having it eight inches across brings it to uh, to right here the the hair that's at my temples uh, and having it four inches on the sides uh, means that it's not too long but it's also not too short uh, I've got plenty of room to have this fold around my chin. So that's what the box pleat does is it allows this to expand by having the box pleat on the outside. It makes it cup my face really nicely. That's one advantage of the box pleat over accordion pleats. But hey, if you've got a mask that you like that's got accordion pleats, keep going for it. But that pleat is what helps make this curve. Now, the wire. is keeping my breath from going up into my glasses, which is really nice. I can feel a little bit escaping here by my ears, but not much down here by my chin. 
So it's a fairly protective mask. It's got the liner on it. Now that I've put it on my face, I have to take it off and put it into the laundry before I can donate it. That's really important because we don't know, even if we're at home and we feel okay and we feel good, we might still have a very mild case of coronavirus and it would be terrible if uh, through carelessness we were to make somebody sick. So after you have made the masks, put them all together, uh, if you're worried about the wires coming out, there's these little mesh bags for um, ladies underwire stuff and you can throw all these into those mesh bags, put it through that hot wash. Don't use a soap or detergent that's got a lot of perfumes or softeners in it because we don't want the, any of those chemicals left behind. But you can use, um, I think, dish soap works. Um, don't use shampoo because usually those have a lot of perfumes. But an unscented dish soap, or uh, if you know that your laundry detergent has no perfumes to it, you can put these through the laundry, hot dryer, put them into a plastic bag, then have them ready to donate. Um, I'm trying to uh, figure out how to organize pickups in my local area so that only one person is going around to, I think we've got uh, 10 or 12 people that are making uh, things right now and we're hoping to get more people. So we're just going to have one person going around to pick up all of the uh, Sona items and take them in to the local hospital. Uh, if you're not in my area and you're not on my email list, that's okay. Uh, start forming one up yourself in your local area. Uh, talk to people. I've got a couple mailing lists that I'm trying to get more information out on. These things are needed and hopefully we can get them out there quickly. Stay crafty. I want to give a few thank yous to Kittitas Valley Healthcare, KVH, for reaching out and letting me spend some time in their lobby taking measurements of one of their doctor's gowns. A big thank you to Purple Door Fabric for putting my information out onto their email. I really appreciate that. Thanks to Mega Moshe for helping me tonight getting my website changed so that my homepage is actually a hosting site for people to download and get this PDF. Uh, thank you to all the people in the current email group to get these made in my local county. Anybody who gets this who's outside the Kittitas Pass County, you are welcome to it. We all need to pull together for this. And thank you everybody who's helping me edit and improve the um, the PDF on this, including my sister, who noticed that it looks like I wrote the word lion instead of iron on the instruction sheet materials list. So that's getting fixed. Thank you, sister.